A central goal of Your Education Matters is to acquaint the public with British Columbian educators in the various roles in which they serve. The largest, most familiar contingent of educators is our teachers, approximately 40,000 in the province. When all the rhetoric is set aside, the heart of education is our public schools and these men and women with whom we directly entrust our children. Your Education Matters operates from the premise that we need to know our teachers. Toward this end, our guest today is Bill Hood, who has taught at the elementary grades at Chief McQuinna Elementary in East Vancouver since the early 90s. After university, Bill worked as a switchman brakeman for CNR for 17 years prior to completing SFU's teacher preparation program. In both his workplaces, Bill has been an active union leader. We are pleased to present this teacher's view of today's public schools on Your Education Matters. goals of our program is not only for people to get to meet the people who we call educators in our society, but to get to understand better the career profiles that led them to where they are in education. And you as a teacher have a little bit of an unusual story to tell, so I wondered if you'd start the program by explaining to us how you found your way into the classroom. Well, uh, when I was in high school, one of the things that was in, on the possible list of uh, careers that I was going to pursue was education and when I got to university I ended up getting a degree in psychology and so I was hoping that I would be just at the top of the curve of being a high school psychology teacher. Unfortunately the school system didn't uh, quite uh, work out that way and so uh, and because my mother had been uh, a teacher I had always been interested in uh, those kinds of things. Um, so initially you wanted to be a secondary teacher. Yeah, I, I actually thought that um, because of who I was as a person I would be better talking about more complicated ideas. Those were the things that were most interesting to me and I was worried that for young children I wouldn't be able to give them the things that they needed and actually it was only because of uh, some coincidences through my work and career on the CNR and the fact that my daughter was in grade five and I was feeling reasonably comfortable talking to her and her friends that she convinced me that I would be okay and so uh, okay as an elementary teacher yes yes okay. that, that, that actually I would be able to see children I would be able to understand their needs I would be so able to relate to them approximately what age did you go into teacher preparation about 39 okay and uh, were there ups and downs about changing careers at that point in life? Did you feel welcome in the teacher preparation program? Did you fit in? Uh, I felt absolutely welcome. Actually, the, the first time I tried, I, I hadn't had enough um, background in current education practice, and so I was fortunate that the school my daughter was going to uh, in East Vancouver allowed me to come in and volunteer. And that, uh, plus a couple of courses that I picked up, uh, seemed to make the difference and uh, once I got into the program at Simon Fraser it was a fabulous program and I felt very welcome and in fact the the module that I was in was actually a, a diversity older person module and so I actually wasn't the oldest person in the class yes yeah, so and, yes, which was interesting has, uh, modules tailored to people returning in midlife to change careers and become a teacher and you were in one of those modules. Absolutely and it struck me that the module was also designed for the needs of the school system so that there is a possibility for people of many different backgrounds and many different ages to be able to provide useful. In my uh, experience people uh, in that age bracket uh, know what they want, they come d back to school, they do very well and they're among the first hired. Um, I was very fortunate that things worked out that way for me. I was just nervous that maybe I wouldn't be able to do this important job. And so... Um, well, that humility is probably one of the reasons why they do so well. Uh, we almost need a different grading scale for the mature learner that comes back to school. So then, did you start with Vancouver School Board? Fortunately, I uh, got a job. Uh, I got hired as a teacher on call and uh, then got the opportunity to, to do some uh, relief uh, work, uh, filling in on some temporary vacancies. And again, fortunately, through a ser series of coincidences, was able to reasonably quickly get a position in a classroom. 
which unfortunately many teachers now yes, uh, it's hard. Have, have not much chance. Yes, and how long have you been at uh, Chief McQuinna? I was there from the fall of 1993. Okay, so your career has basically been at one school. I, I did a long-term uh, vacancy at another east side school for a year before I came here, but since then. Okay, yeah. and uh, could you tell us a little bit about the school? Okay. And characterize the uh, neighborhood and the school that it's in? For sure. Um, it is uh, quite a small school. It's about 250 children. It's uh, also a population that I think wonderfully reflects the diversity of the city. And so I, what I feel like when I'm there is that I'm teaching the community that I feel connected to and that I feel part of. And another factor that I think is a, an influential component of our school is the fact that we have a pretty stable population base. If a child comes to our school in kindergarten or grade one, quite often they stay through till grade seven, which many schools don't have. And that allows us uh, the opportunity to be able to build for uh, a number of years, both with the children and connections with the families. I like to point out that that doesn't happen accidentally. Mm -hmm. You know, that that is partly a result of government policies, and things that we call the social safety net, and uh, uh, specifically the rent subsidy program that uh, compensates for rises and increase, excuse me, increases in rent by letting families uh, stay in their same homes by being given some uh, margin of compensation toward their rent. That's uh, the kind of thing that people forget, I think, about education is that uh, schools have to cope with uh, children moving from school to school, staying one step ahead of the foreclosure uh, if something isn't done to protect them from that. The most vulnerable children are the ones that have that happen. Absolutely, and, and I also think that with the uh, real estate trends in the city, um, we run the risk of possibly creating a situation where uh, families can't afford to come in and uh, the already um, present issue of declining enrollment could be exacerbated through something like that. I think in a city like San Francisco, for instance, uh, very few people in the population are actually under the age of 18. So you end up with this trend possibly towards adult cities and more diverse uh, suburbs. And mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a troubling troubling situation. Yes, right. Yeah, uh, that's certainly a case in a lot of these uh, areas and again that gets to zoning in Vancouver and elsewhere in British Columbia where uh, levels of housing when, when developers make housing they have to make different levels of housing so we keep neighborhoods that have the ability for families to live in them so yes okay so you've outlined uh, the kind of the sociology around the school now take us inside of the school and would you tell us a little bit about life in the school in general and then how it comes into your classroom absolutely so our school is, um, we have a primary annex a few blocks away. And again, this is a topical issue because primary annexes are currently uh, facing economic challenges because they are small. And for many years, the District of Vancouver has actually rightly uh, proclaimed the value of these small uh, family-centered uh, uh, institutions because they offer children a chance to safely explore um, who they are and the things they need to learn. So our school has, a, the actual school I'm in, has a small primary component and then from grade four on two classes, grade four, grade five, grade six, and grade seven. If you were to come to our school, the first thing that I would encourage you to do would be to come on a Friday. And that's because uh, we have weekly assemblies in the gym and if you were to come in uh, to one of these, one of the first things that you would notice would be that there would be children at the front playing piano. And uh, they might be in grade two, they might be in grade seven, um, but they would be probably about three of them taking turns playing songs, some of them by memory and some of them from the uh, paper that they have. This is a program that was organized a few years ago by one of uh, our teachers and administrators who uh, wanted to both provide a nice atmosphere to come into assemblies, but also an opportunity for children to be able to 
uh, challenge themselves to be able to do this. And so quite often, I think coming out of our school, you will have kids who will never play again for such a large audience as they have when they were six or seven or something like that, which is pretty interesting. So the first thing you would see would be somebody playing some music. Then you would see the 10 classes coming in and sitting down and uh, paying attention. And then the principal would welcome us. We would stand up and sing O Canada. And then we would sing a school song. And the school song, again, comes from a program a few years back where uh, we had the opportunity to have an artist in residence come in. And uh, his name was Lowry Olofsson. And what he did was he actually worked with my class. And we wrote a song for our school. And the song is called Speak Up. And it's about how uh, it's challenging but very important to speak up and that we all have to find our voice. And so we start our assemblies with that song. And um, then in the assembly, the principal will essentially tell us what's new. And so it will be achievements of students, it will be interesting information, it will be what time of year it is, it's something that's coming up. And the reason I go on a little bit is it's actually like eating dinner together as a school. So really, if you were to ask the kids, I think they would say that's the real school. I then go into my classroom for some activities that happen, and then we get to see it again. In okay, the well, before we leave the assembly setting, yeah. how is that contributing to education? I mean, we can see how all of that w would be a wonderful experience, but bring it now a little bit more specifically into the realm of uh, what we call the curriculum and education. I guess what I would say is that um, a significant component of the curriculum is each individual person's connection to why we do what we do. And if that is simply, dad tells me I have to do it, or the, print, the uh, teacher tells me that I must do it, we're going to have very limited uh, possible uh, results. Whereas if it's because we are a community, and I am part of that community, and I feel respected, and I feel valued, then it puts a context into why I do what I do. So for instance, when the grade seven stand up and do something, make a presentation, read some poetry, and the kindergartens watch that, they know that that will be them in a few years. And so when they think about the work they're doing, they have in their brain in a way that we couldn't possibly encourage them to have other than through this direct personal experience, the, the drive and the motivation and the understanding of what actually learning is about. So I, uh, words like meaning and motivation come to my mind listening to what you have to say. And uh, as I reflect on my own experience in schools and education, I think, you know, if you solve the motivation problem, you've really solved everything. It's a huge component. Uh, as human beings have tremendous capacity to Absolutely. learn and they're motivated to learn. So you're giving meaning, you're showing why a kid would want to attend to things and learn, and, and you're also providing motivation. They can see themselves someday being the person up in front. Also, if you have an important message for whatever particular reason, you can say it one time and everybody hears it the same. And uh, again, it's another opportunity for them to demonstrate. Invariably, when people come into our school, they comment on how polite, how focused, how responsible the students are. And we talk about being uh, respectful of yourself, respectful of others, and respectful of this place, as, as many schools So do. you're also teaching a whole set of social skills. Ab absolutely. But they get to demonstrate that they can do this. And again, the more real life situations, I think this is true in all aspects of education, the more real life situations you can connect the learning to, the more it becomes richer and so the more it becomes important. So you're teaching things in a concrete fashion, Absolutely. not an abstract fashion and behaviorally rather than just cognitively. For sure. And also it means that after 20 minutes, it's about how long it is, when they go back to class, everybody pretty much feels better, feels more proud and feels more prepared to take on the things of the day. And so therefore, if I've had a bad morning and I come to school and I see the kindergarten kids stand up and take a risk and do something very successfully, I feel better as a person. So it also cultures the affective or emotional climate of Absolutely. things. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you, For Bill. Sure. No problem. We'll be back in a moment. For more than 40 years, the Faculty of Education at SFU has been delivering academic programs that are innovative and responsive. Based on the academic research of our professors and the expertise of practicing teachers from your communities, our programs are designed to meet classroom needs. As a community, we're piecing together a successful education experience for students today and in the future. Bill, you've done a wonderful job of bringing us from the neighborhood into the school assembly, and now we're ready to go into your classroom. So pick it up in your classroom. Okay. So I'm Division Three uh, in Grade Six, 
And if you came into my classroom, probably you would notice there's a lot of stuff all around. And what I try and do is have on the walls and the boards and the tables a number of books and also student work from previous years. And uh, that, from my perspective, helps to create an environment where children see hopefully a microcosm of the real world in the classroom where people are proud of historic things, but they're also looking ahead. They have access to information in a variety of forms. And then you would probably sit down, and if it was a regular day, after um, we came back, you would probably, well, we would start off with math, but what you would notice looking at the front board is it had a whole bunch of writing on it. And this writing would probably be in different colored chalk, and it's my current events program. And this is a program that I do that uh, people in the rest of the school don't do. And just as a tangent, what I would say is one of the things that I think is a huge strength of our school is the diversity of the programs or the way that the curriculum is delivered in each classroom based, I think, quite often in the passion of the individual educator. So if you are a music educator, then the, that is the lens that you help to focus the curriculum. If you are a writer, then that with their lens. So it's so, the antithesis of operating from scripts and one size fits all. Uh, absolutely, although those may be required in, in extreme situations. But yes, I would say that that's the case. And so what you would see on the board on an average day is say 10 news stories. And before I get to the classroom, I've read a couple of newspapers, I've looked online, and I have some books about things that happen on different days in history. And I choose carefully stories that I would like the kids to talk about. And uh, so the children, when they come in, uh, write their name on the board in a list, and the first person gets to pick whichever story they want to. And the, the words in the story have letters missing. So at a very basic level, it's a vocabulary building activity. And the students quickly learn that in order to try to solve a story, they don't have to know even all the words in the story. They don't have to know what the story's about. They just have to be prepared to try. And so they will try, and if they get stuck on something, I will gently help them through. And then once a story has been uh, finished, uh, then I'll say there's a couple of key words in here, controversial, and um, possibly a location. And so I'd say, does anybody know what the word controversial means? And so we'll have a conversation about what controversial is. And some of the students uh, may know or may not. And so I'll gently uh, lead them to uh, an understanding of what that word might be. And then I have a map right beside there. So if we are talking, for instance, when the Chilean miners were trapped, we would just pull down the map and say, OK, does anybody know where Chile is? And so people will pull Now, the strength of this is you're integrating many disciplines together, and you're infusing it with meaning and feeling. But some people would be concerned that you're not so-called covering the curriculum. How do you make sure that you're getting across all the certain objectives that should be gotten across Absolutely. to students at this I, age? Absolutely. I, appre I appreciate that you asked that. Um, the categories that are, the stories are divided into are sort of news events, politics, culture, science, and sports, and history. And so what will happen on an every average day is there'll be something of every one of those topics that's actually happening oh, in the world. Oh, so you pick the stories to lead exactly. you into different parts of the And curriculum. so therefore, if I'm somebody, for instance, who traditionally pays attention to sports and feels that that's not in school, that's just what I do on my own time, I know that coming to Mr. Hood's class, there'll be a story there for me. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I can talk about that. And we won't have an extensive conversation about how unfortunate the Canucks lost it was, or something like that. But it will be something that we recognize has happened, so and then we'll go on to something else. Uh, it's a way that you have of tailoring the curriculum to individuals and Absolutely. acknowledging the differences among the learners. For sure. And then what I would say also is that, so this happens every day. And then at the end of each month, I assemble a study guide based on the stories of that month. They take the study guide, study it in a variety of contexts, and we practice that in, in class. And then there's a test. And then there's a separate letter grade on their report cards for current events. And uh, the tests are designed in such a way as there's bonus marks. So for instance, if you understand the bare basics of a story, you will get full marks. If you can go on in depth about possibly some of the sub-stories or some of the connected mm -hmm. information, you'll get more marks for that. And do you have reason to believe that you are achieving the curricular objectives and the disciplines? 
math, science, language arts, and so on for the students? Um, that's, a, that's a really good question because I think actually educators wrestle with that all the time because we never really see the finished product of our work. We are all on a chain and a process. What I would say to you is that we send most of our kids to the local high school, which is Van Tech, and every year our school has an overrepresentation on mini school programs and on honor roll lists and on uh, involvement in the school in a variety of levels from academic to social to volunteering to sports and at the grade 12 uh, graduations when they actually come back and invite us to come to those um, many of them win scholarships so, so it's a very holistic approach and the, then the question that arises is uh, do you do you, do you have some method of understanding that you're not missing anything? You know, they've got the big picture, they can't miss the mm -hmm. big picture, but are they getting the fundamentals, the building blocks of the disciplines, and the fundamental knowledge that they need to go on to more advanced learning sure. in some fields that are fairly linear, Absolutely. You know, like math, like yeah. music, like science? Absolutely. And again, so I'm talking about my class. My class is mm -hmm. one of ten classes. At most, a child would be with me for one year. And so we meet as a staff on a regular basis. Uh, we are involved in professional development around the province, as are all other teachers. And we're constantly reflecting on, so how are we doing? How is it going? We have a variety of opportunities to uh, observe evidence of student growth and student learning. And we're constantly trying to fine tune. All right, so I'll give you a concrete example from our school. Our school has a very large uh, Chinese-Canadian population. A number of years ago, maybe eight or nine, we were starting to notice that by the time kids got to grade seven, they were a lot more quiet than they were when they were in a younger grade. And so we sort of did some investigation and we came to the conclusion that a number of our students, for a variety of reasons, many of them sound and reasonable, got the message, not spoken but unspoken, that a good kid was a quiet kid. And the complication is that's only partially true. And so, of course, in education, if you are quiet or silent, it doesn't happen. And so what we had to do was to take on the complex issue of uh, encouraging them to be more vocal so that they could both contribute but also intensify uh, their learning. So we took on a goal of oral language. and. Uh, all of the teachers would look to their delivery of their program in their class and try and find ways that they could tweak, add, uh, adjust their program so that oral language was more included. In my class, for instance, this took the form of these current events discussions. We have regular debates as well. Um, so now, when we have our ongoing goal, as many of the schools in Vancouver do, of literacy, it's literacy in the context and of oral language and also in the context of the community that we live in. So um, we all live with the difficult challenge of never really being able to know. If you are working in a sawmill and you need to get 10,000 board feet, you can count them up and say, did you get them? Well, those who advocate for ranking and testing feel that they know by those methodologies, but I take it that you don't feel those are fully revealing of the work of the teacher. I think they could actually do with some lessons in humility and uh, understanding the complexity <laughs> of the human being. Myself. When you interact with uh, parents yeah. and uh, community members right. and when you watch the media, what do you think is well understood and not so well understood about what's going on in schools like yours? A very interesting uh, comment that I got a few years ago from an administrator uh, who's a fabulous, fabulous guy was that the untold truth is that virtually every parent feels that their school is great and that their yeah. kid's teacher is great. It's just all those other schools and all those other teachers that are problems. And so you have this situation where because we don't really have an ongoing facilitated public discussion about public education and our goals and the involvement of many different institutions and many different people, that people don't get to hear that and they don't get to see that. It doesn't mean it's not true. It just means we don't have a way of knowing that. And so that also is not really as good a news story as a uh, fire engine and a uh, car crash and somebody being convicted okay. of bribery or something like that. Well, uh, also I mentioned in the introduction that you've been an active union right. member throughout your career and both careers that you've had. Do you feel that the BCTF is well understood, accurately understood uh, by the public? Uh, if not, how is it not understood? 
I think that the BCTF, it, our news media and the way that we understand stories in, in our world, it's very difficult to tell a multi-dimensional complex story and people are more interested in what they think is a clear story but really is only a small piece, whether it's a test or whether it's a 30 second soundbite. And so I think that people tend to misunderstand the BCTF as this monolithic organization that basically whips people into shape and gives them an agenda and tells them, here's your marching orders, go out and do this, as opposed to imagine your family. I mean, I don't know a single family that would be run that way, even the one with most challenges, right? <laughs> and so therefore what it is, is it's a group of seriously dedicated professionals who care very passionately about their work, who come together on a regular basis to talk about how can we make it better? What exactly do we want? How do we proceed? So if, I think the thing that would be best uh, added to a person's understanding of the BCTF would be to see it as an ongoing discussion, a series of ongoing discussions where, newsflash, there's a diversity of opinion, just like in the rest of the world, where there are people who care more particularly about one particular issue than something else. Again, newsflash, that's in the rest of the world. And so what we have, our only control as a society or as an organization, is we have democracy, we invite people to speak their mind, and we have confidence that the vast majority of people will make the right decision, provided accurate information and an opportunity to discuss. Well, on that note of democracy, I think uh, that's a good place for us to close. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. We'll be back in a moment. Wouldn't you agree that it is critical whom a society puts forward as its teachers? After the home, the school is the great personal, interactive influence on children and youth. This influence carries far beyond the transmission of knowledge. Teachers model each aspect of what it is to be a member of our society. They reveal and nurture the unique dimensions of our personalities. They offer us a reflective expansion on the influences we receive from home and family. They evaluate our potential. They advocate for us. They engage our consciences and our intellects. From time to time on Your Education Matters, we offer a platform to representative British Columbian teachers. We encourage you to look deeply at the character and ideas of these men and women. After all the political controversy and media noise about education, this fact remains. British Columbia selects its teachers and entrusts them to make a better society through their work with our children. <laughs>